Good afternoon and welcome to the session in the Beta Zone. Uh, today our topic is the future of computing. Our guest today is from Hewlett Packard Labs, as I've been coached. Uh, his name is Kirk Bresnicker. He is the chief architect and fellow, uh, a longtime employee of Hewlett Packard HP of 29, 30 years, and the holder of over 28 patents. He will share with us today uh, a major research initiative at Hewlett Packard about uh, paradigm shifting changes in the world of computing and how we think about hardware, processing, and software. With that, I welcome Kirk to the stage. Thank you, May. We've never experienced change faster than we have right now. It's never been like this before. And that's really, that's really false. Our parents said that. Their parents said that. Our children say it, will say it, and their children will say it. It's not that the change is unprecedented. As a matter of fact, it's predictable, but it's a mathematics that we find challenging. Innovation and adoption are driven from the exponential growth curve, a curve where every time we move forward, a unit in time, what we measure doubles. And the challenge is that almost all of us are really bad at making predictions based on exponential growth curves. And there's really sort of three challenges we have. One of scale, one of the rate of change, and the last one is the tail off. Now when we look at this exponential growth curve, it's hard to wrap our heads around how big the numbers are. And one way I, I use with my children to explain this is a story. It's the story of the rice grains on the chessboard. A king once commissioned a beautiful chessboard, and the artisan came back, and the king was so delighted, he said, I'll give you anything that you want in payment. And the wily craftsperson said, well, I just, want, I just want some grains of rice. Place one grain of rice on the first square, two grains of rice on the second square, and keep on going. And the king says, that's fine. By the time he had finished the second row, it was only one kilo of rice, but then it was two, four, eight. By the time you get to the 64th square on the chessboard, it would take you 10 centuries of global rice production to fill that board. And that's the first challenge we have, is one of scale, getting our heads wrapped around how big these numbers will get, how quickly. The second challenge we have is rate. We look at this curve and we think, you know what? There's a knee in the curve. There's a shallow part at the beginning, and then there's something that happens, and then it gets steep. And that's because we project linear thinking onto this exponential growth curve. But if you remember your calculus, the rate of change of an exponential curve is the curve itself. It self-describes, and that means it's changing continuously. That also means if we think of all of this growth, and then we just project forward in time, all of that growth gets down here. And what we used to think was that knee in the curve, now it's down here. It's in what we thought was flat. So there's an illusion of a before, a middle, and an after. And we have to realize that the change is continuous. And the last thing that we have that's a challenge with the growth curve is when it begins to slow down. And that's because anything, a physical process driving along an exponential growth curve, eventually it runs out and it consumes its resource whether this is food inside of a petri dish for exponential growth of bacteria, or it is the atoms that we can fit inside of a transistor according to the Bohr's law scaling, eventually we flatten out. And it doesn't matter how much we wish or how much we will invest, when you have re reached the end of your resource, you need to find a new curve because this one is not going to change. So we think of those three challenges, scale, rate, and tail off. We find that with exponential growth curves, if we understand those, we can make critical investments and critical decisions. And I actually think that's where we find ourselves in computing right now. For the last 70 years, computing has been fundamental in reshaping our world. It really is the underpinning of the fourth industrial revolution. But as we find ourselves on the eve of that revolution, we find that the underlying technologies beneath information technology are all on this flattened curve where we press it over and we're beginning to slow down. 
when we started, I started looking at this question inside of Hewlett Packard in about 2010 and started asking ourselves the uncomfortable question, if there is simultaneous regime change, if the technologies that underpin information technology all were flattening out simultaneously and new technologies were going to sweep in, were we going to be in the position to take advantage or would we cling to the old models in the hopes, the unfounded hopes, that somehow we could change the shape of that curve? And as we investigated it, first it was spurred on by, by Moore's law and the, the, the flattening out of semiconductor process advantage. But it was more than that. And really, that was the understanding that there is a whole cadre of technologies that are now becoming mature and there's something else waiting to come in. I'll talk about 10 of these trends, 10 of these things that are inverting. The way that we used to do it is not going to be the way that we'll do it in the future. And the first of them is Programming. Programming was the way, program, if you had control of the code, you had control of the situation. And now that is going to be replaced by training. And this is a massive shift because what this is saying is that the person who's in control of the data is actually in the point of control. And that will shift dramatically because there's many more people who have data than have had code. The next one is Moore's Law. There has basically been one physics that has underpinned the success and the global contribution of productivity in providing information technology, and that was the physics of, of semiconductor scaling. We will now move to multiple physics, whether it is quantum, neuromorphic, photonic, memory-driven. Next generation technology is a wider variety of technologies and physics, and that means more people can participate than have been in the past. Before, it was all about gathering and centralizing data. And I want to say that I look forward to the period in the very near future where data center will be an oxymoron. Because data isn't centered. Data pervades our world. And we need to understand how we will take advantage of data everywhere. How do we admit every byte in the world, every sensor reading, into economic activity that's meaningful? We're going to move from imperative management the what if, if then, if then, if then. That was the kind of technology that enabled us to have those first DARPA autonomous tra uh, vehicle challenges and have a, something the size of an RV trundle down the road at three miles an hour and hit the only up, up, uh, tree in an otherwise obstructed field. You cannot have complex systems like this and enumerate all the what ifs. You need to move to declarative management. You need to declare your goals and have systems that are intelligent enough to seek those goals on your behalf, still informing you of all the decisions, but you have to take the eyeball and the brain and the hand out of the loop of control. We have been used forever to scarce memory. Go back to von Neumann's original 46 paper on Edvac. Memory, he said, was the key limiter to high performance computation. It's been that way until now, and now this is an opportunity. Memories will continue to scale even when computation doesn't because memories can scale in a three-dimensional three -dimensional structure much more efficiently than computation. So we're going to get to abundant and persistent memory. And persistence is important not because of reliability, although that's a benefit. Memory that is persistent is energy efficient. It is scalable in energy, and that allows us to retain all those zettabytes of data in the world and bring them into activity and afford the energy to do so. We're going to move from a hindsight model. We think of the enterprise today. I, I know our own enterprise, thousands of relational databases extracting, translating, loading information between them. What we really want to move to is a foresight model, where all of the information about the enterprise, whether it is in an enterprise core operation, whether it's out there in the cloud, whether it's in all of those 10 billion smart things, yields foresight. I not only have the instantaneous understanding of my position, because all my data is in memory, on a fabric, accessible to all of those machine learning and advanced analytics techniques, and I can also project forward with foresight. We want to move from general purpose. We have lived under the tyranny of general purpose for the last 40 years, and it's been the right thing to do. It would have been foolish not to take advantage of semiconductor scaling and a consistent technology 
model in programming, software development, microprocessor architecture. But now we need to move to the built for purpose. Because whether I'm creating an exascale data center that capable of a billion, billion operations per second, or I want to have 10 billion smart things out in the world, I no longer have a tolerance for inefficiency and waste. I'm multiplying times numbers that are too big for me to tolerate the general purpose as opposed to the specialized. We want to move from a centralized authority to a fully distributed model, whether this is blockchain, whether this is those intelligent things, understanding how we push computation out to where the data is in full fidelity, unreduced, unredacted, out there in those things, that's the important element for us to consider. Dis distributed systems are more complex, but they're arguably more efficient, more sustainable, more equitable, and therefore arguably more just. We want to move from proprietary. We have already seen the beginning of this in open software development. We'll see this percolate down the stacks to the base technologies, admitting more people for more innovation down at the semiconductor level and below. Open systems. And finally, we're going to move from a world where data has been a cost. Everything about information technology for the last 70 years has been about increasing efficiency of the way we've always done things. But now, data is the opportunity. The more data you have, the more opportunity you have. The more you can analyze, the more competitive you can be. And we look at all these 10, 10 factors, these 10 things where the last shall become first and the first shall become last, and we think of the, the enterprise that is going to lean into these opportunities. This is a new species of enterprise. It is the enterprise of the fourth industrial revolution. It is the hyper-competitive digital enterprise. When I think of the characteristics of this enterprise, the first is that they understand data is their most valuable resource. So they will meticulously instrument everything, every manufacturing process, every business operation, every customer interaction, every physical thing will be instrumented because the more data they generate, the more opportunity. The more they can correlate that data between themselves and others, the more opportunity. They will view the computational platform from the core of the enterprise to the cloud and out to all those things, not as a set of dichotomies, but as one continuum. They will relentlessly analyze this data for process improvement, for warranty reduction, for customer industry, for investment, uh, investment guidance and protection, or for direct monetization. And I think very quickly, you will either be one of these hyper-competitive digital enterprises, or you will be desperately wondering, how will I compete with one? This is an opportunity, really, that has been 70 years in the making, the opportunity to break the rules. There has never been a better time to break the rules. In, in our research programs at labs, the work we've done across the industry has been about breaking these rules, breaking the way that compute is designed, breaking the way that applications are created, breaking the way that data is turned into value. And as we break these rules, that really sets up the opportunity for you to break these rules. We're at a fantastic point now this bullseye is where I see us on this next generation as we have taken all of those simultaneous inversions and plotted out that next exponential growth curve that will enable the fourth industrial revolution. I think of the legacy architecture. It was important for us. We needed that. We could not have conceived of the fourth industrial revolution without the conventional technology, but we will not be able to achieve it with that conventional technology. We need this new curve. We need to find this new way. And for me, the opportunity is for those who have been on the outside. If you didn't invest in semiconductor IP back in the 70s, if you didn't get on that first Moore's Law curve, this is the invitation. New physics, new opportunity, new ways of constructing applications, new admission of innovation and of innovators into the economics of this next generation, this next era in computer science. And so for, for me, I find it really encouraging. While others might cling to those old curves, might try and eke out a little change, a little inflection, 
the, so the scale, the rate, and the tail off are inevitable. And that's really the opportunity for us is to understand the value, the value of investing now, the value of placing that first grain of rice on the first square of this chessboard. So thank you, and we'll take questions now. So we have mics around the room. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, this is an unusually shy group. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm, I'm uh, oh, here we go. I, I was going to start with a question, but we have one in the corner. Do you have a, a small example, a thin vertical slice of what, one, what your vision of one of those organizations would look like that meets that criteria? And then as a follow-on, specifically with neuromorphics, what are you doing in that field? Sure. So when I think of, when I think of what is that hyper-connected enterprise, you know, I think of an enterprise that understands, first, where all the data is, understands what data is located where it can be co-located in large pools of a memory. I think of our own enterprise, really. Uh, understanding that business systems today, 16,000 relational databases, a quarter million batch jobs every month shuffling around, and our leadership team knows the state of the enterprise two days after the quarter closes, because that's how long it takes the books, and really the only thing they knew was the state of the enterprise for one brief shining moment 48 hours ago, and then it moves on again. And when I think of these, these enterprises that are like that, you have all this data in persistent memory, and you're able to not only analyze the instantaneous position, what is my instantaneous, what is my gain insight, what is my position right now? If you think of, of, a, of a bank being able to instantaneously evaluate its risk portfolio, so it keeps the absolute bare minimum of capital off to the side to remain liquid and meet their regulatory burden. So understanding how you hold all that enterprise data in memory, and then how do you connect to all of those things, all of those manufacturing things. I think of the, of the millions of servers that we've, we've shipped over my career, millions, tens of millions. How much of those actually come back and contribute their history, their provenance, their data back to inform not only our manufacturing team, but our design teams? I think that's that, that goal of connecting edge to cloud to core, that fully connected experience that every manufactured item now is connected intimately and perpetually back to the enterprise. There is no more data lost. The other way I think about it is to say, is how can I answer the question, the affirmatively, you know, why'd you throw the data away? And usually the, the answer is, it wasn't worth it. And for me, that's fascinating because that's a return on investment. And I actually think I can affect both the numerator and the denominator of this work. I can bring more analysis to data for lower cost. I can also bring more security, so more data can be brought securely into the system. So that's all of those pieces there that are how we sort of conceive of this very competitive enterprise, that ability to not just have insight but foresight across the entire data that forms the heart of your enterprise. Now, your second question was about neuromorphic computing. For us, this is understanding how I can create systems that don't model the human, the, you know, the human or the mammalian um, neuron in floating point arithmetic, because that means I have done a conversion, I have to move, there's data movement. How can I create analog computation that much closer, using, using that new physics, so for us, it's understanding how a crossbar of, of memristors uh, allows me to do vector matrix multiplication, the heart of machine learning, the heart of digital signal processing. How can I do that in the analog domain? Why am I converting data into binary to do binary arithmetic and then do an, what immensely comes back as an analog computation out of all that? Why don't I keep it in the analog domain? Why don't I flow analog data through this? So, there won't just be one physics. It's the physics of quantum for the d drug discovery or materials, material discovery. It is large memory systems for real-time analytics. It is these neuromorphic systems to do very low energy or very fast machine learning inference and training. There won't be one technology. And I think that's really, again, the opportunity for all of us is that so far it has been one technology, and as we have matured as Moore's law has gone up, as Rock's law, the law of expense of creating an extraordinary fab, all those are recipes for consolidation. So there's been fewer and fewer players who could economically enter into innovation. 
And this is really the opportunity. There's more people. Now, this is opening it all up. More people can economically enter into innovation. Uh, our recently retired senior fellow, Stan Williams, said that the end of Moore's Law is the best thing to happen to computing since the start of, uh, the start of Moore's Law, because it's, it's just opening up for more people to get more creative. They can't, you can't buck that, that curve, and you would have been foolish to do so while it was steep. Now that it's shallow, we really need to entertain that last picture and jump over to the new curve. I don't know, let's see, you had your hand up first. Oh wait, just hang, just hang on and wait for a microphone. Who do you see as the early adopters of these new paradigms? Is it cloud service providers? Is it the finance industry with high frequency trading? Also, given the fact that many of these things require architectural changes and investment. So uh, as far as early adopters, um, I think that this is where uh, it, is, it is the startups. And it's not, just, it's not just in one thing. It's not just software startups. We're seeing incredible, vibrant startup communities now in hardware. Some of you may be familiar with the RISC-5 uh, work out of University of California at Berkeley, an open source innovative microarchitecture with no licensing and no fees. And that is open for innovation. And what's fascinating to, that about, to me about that is it's just lowering that barrier to precision innovation. And there's lots and lots of startups who are back in the semiconductor game. It used to be, you know, when I started HP, there were about 25 competitive architectures out there. Now there's basically two. It's either x86 or it's ARM, or there's a tiny fraction of other things. This is now opening that up again, and that's so vibrant and exciting. And it's not just the microprocessor, it's all these other computational techniques coming together. So I'm seeing large start, you know, the startup, that sort of vibrant startup activity. But what they can do now is just so much more than they could. It's not just about software anymore. It's about precision application of these technologies to interesting problems. Microphone down here. Coming right here. Good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm Julia Danzi, I'm a global shaper, and uh, in this new curve of technology, what's the role of human? What's the role of human especially with interacting uh, with the machines uh, and uh, what we call collective technology? I'm sorry, I didn't I hear the, what is the... The role of humans. Uh, so oh, the role of humans. Yeah, okay. especially like, like what we call collective technology. Yeah, uh, so I, I generally see these as, as enabling tools. Um, you know, we, we, have, we have the ethical discussions of, of machine intelligence and artificial intelligence. I, I do not worry about Skynet, about some, some simultaneous, spontaneous eruption of machine intelligence. Uh, I do worry very much about understanding how very productive machine learning techniques affect and can predict my behavior so that when I'm marketed to or I'm influenced, understanding that piece of it. Uh, for me, this is really a fantastic, again, a fantastic opportunity. There have been so many people, so many creative people, that have been excluded from a huge piece of, of semiconductor in innovation. Because if you didn't work for just a handful of the companies that could afford to be on the innovation curve when it was steep, then you couldn't, you couldn't innovate in semiconductors. You, didn't, you couldn't innovate in, uh, down at the architectural level so for me, the, the big opportunity here is more people coming in and innovating. So I think that's the first question, is, is more diverse and more diverse um, innovation and more diverse set of innovators. So I think that's a huge potential. On all of these tools, um, you know, there certainly is that question of toward what purpose. There's a lot of the, you know, the work we have been exploring in, for example, artificial intelligence isn't so much about the ethical use of the outcome is how sustainable is the process right now? Um, I spend so much energy to construct this machine learning model, regardless of what it's used for, is that actually a, a net benefit for society? Running all of those floating point options, all those GPUs burning racks and racks of power, what's the net benefit? Can I actually sum up the, the positive influence? Now, for us, breakthroughs in the innovation technology allow me to affect the space weight and the power, the cost that goes into those. So I think that's one of those questions. I, enabling the tools and enabling more people to have access to the tools. You know, if we don't change the curve, we'll still have innovation, but it won't be equitably distributed. So for me, part of this work is understanding how we reduce those costs 
so we can actually afford everyone the opportunities of machine learning, and not just have it be reserved for the few, the nation states, or the really large enterprises that can afford you know, to spend the power budget of a, a nation state just to construct machine learning models. And that's where we are now. As effective as they are, how, how equitably can they be uh, generated? So I think that's another piece of the equation. How can I make sure that everyone can participate in the benefits of this technology? Uh, I'm going from Nankai University. In your answer to her question, you mentioned about the power consumption. I think that is a big concern for the future computing. Could you give more comments or what's the, the way out from the yeah. so, so large power consumption and grow so fast today? Absolutely. So I think there's, there's a couple elements to the power question. Uh, the number one power element is, is usually not computation. It's actually moving the data around. So a big piece of this is, is certainly is, is to understanding, is there novel physics? Is there a way, as I mentioned with the, with the neuromorphic processing, to use something other than the von Neumann model to do the work that we want to have done? There's also the question of, as I construct these systems, how can I avoid data movement? And part of that is understanding, can I create a distributed system that's trustworthy enough and reliable enough then I can actually move, instead of moving the data to a centralized location, a lot of cost and energy and time, doing a lot of high power work, can I actually move the question out to the data? Do I actually know where all the information is so I can distribute the query? Distributed queries, much, you know, uh, sort of the equivalent of the scatter gather model, but on a global scale. And I think when we look at those, we find out not only that we're, trying, we're using less energy because we're moving less data, when we talk about what's actually at those edge devices, can we actually construct them out of systems that use not generated energy, but harvested energy? Can I apply the fact that I have neuromorphic and very low energy techniques, non-volatile memories, and reduce the overall energy to reach a solution, and actually have the benefit of the fact that I am operating on all of the data, because it's, it's distributing the query out to where all those things, where I've had the energy richness to record all the information. So rather than the reduced and redacted and summarized version that gives me a partial answer when I centered it, can I actually use the fact that I'm distributing systems to, again, having systems that are much more sustainable and something that I can actually afford to distribute. So distributed systems for me, while they are definitely more complex, they are, they, they are more robust because you can't attack a distributed system the way you had in a centralized. They're, they have more sustainable because I have the opportunity, perhaps, to look for this harvested energy, low quality energy, instead of high quality, um, non-sustainable non energy. So changing that, that profile and doing that, doing that big path integral over all of the energy, I think that's really the, the question we have to ask ourselves. And for me, it goes all the way back to the manufacturing techniques to create the systems. You know, we were, I was having an argument this morning about someone saying, I want to create zero, zero carbon, carbon neutral homes. And I said, well, did you include the energy it took to make all the building supplies and to move them to the location? And, and it was just, how far back do you draw the line? And I think another piece of this for me is the hyper-competitive real-time digital enterprise, they can answer those kinds of questions and answer them in a time frame that matters. Not to do a study over weeks or months, but to say, no, what is my position right now? What is my carbon position right now? What is my energy position right now? And if I make this change, what will that outcome be? And we need to have our leadership teams have these kinds of systems so that they can answer those questions as they arise. Or even better, have the questions predicted by the data itself so that when they ask it, there's an immediate answer. So actually, I have uh, three kind of related questions with the amount of time that we have left. So this future that you've described, in your opinion, what are the critical things that have to happen, two or three major things that have to happen uh, in order for this to become a reality? Mm -hmm. uh, the second question is, when do you think those things will happen? And then maybe the, the third question I have is, we were talking before the session started, my coding uh, career ended in university at Fortran when I dropped my box of 
punch cards. And I thought, well, that's, that's the, under, I'm not, you know, it's the, it's the computer coding equivalent of the dog ate my homework. So I know we have some educators in the room, including the president of McGill. So many students now, millions of students around the world are learning how to code. So it used to be basic Fortran COBOL, C++, Java, now it's Python. What do we teach our students as the software languages start to change? So fascinating question. So as far as, you know, what are the precursors to this? And, and that's really, that was really the function we've been doing at the lab. So I came to the labs four years ago. Before that, I spent, as you said, 25 years in the product divisions, engineering product, engineering conventional product. And as we were doing this, there's always that piece, no matter how successful you are, there's that piece of the, of the result that says, there's something different, there's something better. I'm, I'm making incremental improvements. What does it take to take that great leap forward? And that was part of this, was understanding those technologies. And for us, there's, there's sort of three hardware technologies that come together. One is understanding the next generation of memory technologies. And the reason this is fundamental is that it, it changes the energy profile of information. It changes the, the time profile to get to solution. And it's also, as we run out of Moore's Law, and we think, I don't have to look out of the window here, if you don't have room in extra Y, there's only one more dimension to go, Z-axis. So three-dimensional scaling. Three-dimensional scaling is just more efficient in memory devices. If I lose one transistor out of a microprocessor, that's a dead, that's a dead microprocessor. If I lose one bit out of a memory, well, there's a billion more just like it next to it. That inherent redundancy and repairability of memory allows me to scale layers inside of the semiconductor die, dies inside of a package, package inside of a module. Now, the second piece is the precursor is a next generation way to connect this information. And that's twofold. One is a memory semantic fabric, a way to describe the way that information flows that really understands that these are memory devices. And the second is, the sh is a shift of physics. Instead of the venerable electron, which we have been using um, for, forever to transmit information, we want to switch to the photon. Now, we've had fiber optics for decades, but here we're talking about fiber optics that is efficient enough so that if I'm going over 10 centimeters, I'll switch over photonics. But then that's really where it, it really blossoms because I can go 10 centimeters with photonics or I can go 1,000 meters, and it costs me the same amount of energy because photons don't lose when they go through a fiber. So now I have this three-dimensional scaling. where I, That's where it takes the memories from, from module to enclosure to rack to row across the entire exascale data center. So photonically connected fabrics is the second piece. And the last is those, that, those task-specific processors. And this is where we had a conversation earlier today about the next generation electronic design tools. How do I take an application, an algorithm, and generate task-specific silicon economically. Now, the first piece of this is, is that we all pile up at the top of Moore's Law, out there at five nanometers or seven nanometers, whatever it ends up being. There's huge swaths of capacity globally at the older steps. And now this becomes a buyer's market. This is this capacity. And there's so many applications, especially edge applications, IoT applications, where five nanometers is complete overkill. So understanding how we utilize that capacity efficiently and get just the right custom silicon for a much lower price, I think, is an important precursor. So on all of these things, the key is open, is that we have to move beyond the proprietary. We have to realize that all of us are smarter than any one of us. And having that, lowering that bar to innovation, a memory fabric that's open means that everyone can plug in their accelerator and rather than being a thousand times slower out in a card you plug in the back of your server, having it right there next to the memories, being able to precisely assemble GPUs, CPUs, all those memory devices, whether I'm talking about something I would hold in my hand, implant in my body, or something that would span a data center, that's all facilitated by open innovation. So I think that's, that's the last piece. So those are the what's, fabrics, photonics, computational accelerators and those memory devices. Now the next piece, they actually go together because it's, the question is, what do I need? Do I have to start with, with, uh, with, uh, with six-year-olds and inter introduce them into the next generation of computer science? No, we, we need to understand how do we bridge to today's applications? How do we make today's applications run better? And at the same time, inform that new creative uh, group about 
what is it like? What is it like to program with abundant memory? What is it like to have this huge swath of accelerators right next to those general purpose processors to create a novel application? What is it like to craft these, this next generation? And for us, that is 100% experiential learning. You really need to create these systems. That was the other piece about what we're doing at the labs. We needed to create a big memory system. I created a prototype with 160 terabytes of memory, 1,280 ARM cores, like 10 times as much stuff in one box as anyone had ever put together. Not just sort of theoretically put together, but actually put together as a working model. And that was so important because from when I told the teams what to expect and when they actually came back with something that was a completely different approach, it was about a year. It took them about a year to unlearn the usual aspects and, and, and really embrace this new technology. You know, computer science is, is a practical science of working around adversity. I only have this many bytes of memory. I only have this many CPU cycles. How do I do the most with those? And so sometimes when you give them, you say, this used to be a scarce resource and now I want you to treat it as abundant. They won't believe you. They'll keep working around the edges, uh, especially when you're doing a prototype where it's not perfect yet. Um, so that's been a big piece. So when I think of the, of the when, when are we seeing these things? We've done important work um, globally amongst our peers, uh, our partners and our competitors on things like these next generation open standards. So being a participant with the RISC-V forum out of University of California, Berkeley, being a founding member of the Gen Z Memory Fabric Consortium. These things are out there now. I think that there is about a two year gestation period on a lot of these things for those first semiconductor teams to sort of come to the call. Uh, so we've sort of demonstrated, we've plotted out those first couple spots on the curve, and nearly that's what we're looking for next, is that broader adoption, those broader participation. Uh, and again, for us, part of this is understanding how do we, how do we continue to accelerate that process? Uh, I know one of the things that we just set up uh, at one of my labs is what we call a sandbox system. So we put 48 terabytes of memory, uh, 64 high-end processor cores, uh, a couple 64 high-end accelerator slots, and we're going to open it up. We're going to let people come in, make a pitch, say, you know what, I've never, I've never programmed on more than, than one or two terabytes of memory. What is it like to ruin 48? The only way you'll learn is by doing it. So that's a big piece of what we're trying to do, is accelerate that discussion. Um, we've had these amazing results uh, working with um, some research institutions like DZNE, the German National Center for Neurodegenerative Disease Research. And we took a, a segment of code they thought was as, this, was as optimized as it could be. In the matter of four weeks, we got it to run 10 times faster. In the matter of another four months, we got it to run another 10 times faster. It changes the way the researchers behave. But those are sort of one-to-one, one-to-one um, -one relationships with our labs teams and, and a group. A big piece right now we're trying to figure out is how do we proliferate? How do we get more tools into more hands so they can begin to go down and be just as creative as, as these teams have been? Okay, uh, we're down to our last few minutes. Does anybody else have questions for Kirk? All right, then I hope you will join me in thanking Kirk for this amazing presentation and I wish all of you a good evening. Thank you.